So um, I suspect some of you guys are not going to be uh, with this way, but I, I found that the end of whatever, I guess it's book two, not to be very engaging where he was hating on Germans so much. I mean, I not that I mind hating on Germans. It's not that. It's just that it was like all the things that he said, it's like I didn't care that much about. I, I was curious what Chase might say about section 99 where he talks about sort of the legacy of Schopenhauer. Um, I also, I, I was wondering what the source of this story was, you know, at the, on, in, on section 103, um, at least in the Cambridge edition, I had heard this story. I heard it more embellished than what he gives it, but he talks, he talks about, um, you know, Beethoven and Goethe. And the story, the way I heard it is that they were at this event um, and, but Beethoven and Goethe were on this path and this person, uh, who is it? Anyway, this luminary, the Empress passed, passed and uh, Beethoven stood there with his arms crossed across the path and Beethoven or uh, Goethe stood off to the side of the paths and, you know, and, and doffed his hat. And, um, that was supposed to be a sort of an indication of the different, I don't know, level of civility or something. So I, I didn't, I had forgotten that that story was actually in the text. I thought it was maybe apocryphal. Um, but anyway, I, other than that, I wasn't all that excited about that section. I thought some of the stuff in the book three, it was really interesting especially the stuff about the origin of knowledge and logical and the cause and effect and all that kind of stuff. But, um, and the herd where he starts hating on the herd again. So anyway, there's a summary of what I found interesting and not. So you guys can say whatever you want. Um, By the way, I do have German heritage, so I can talk, I can talk shit about Germans. Oh, well, I do too. I also have Italian and French heritage, so I can talk shit about all those people. Yeah. Right. And I'm Czech, so I get to talk shit about the Germans, but a, as an oppressed versus oppressor relationship. So y'all are dirty imperialists, and I'm uh, calling you out. Yeah, Sean is in the structurally weaker position here, and so any critique that we mount against Sean is guilty of insensitivity to his plight, or at the very least, uh, callousness. Exactly, exactly. Yes. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> let's say Johnson is not a Czech name. Well, uh, my <laughs> family names are Czerny, uh, Havron, and Gajewski, which is Polish, but if he great-grandpa married uh, uh, Great grandma Havron, right? And all the kids learned to check because the was check. So, how'd you end up with Johnson? Yeah, what my, the fuck? Because my dad's a dirty uh, uh, Midwesterner, right? Like they, <laughs> like my dad's side of the family, they came over in like 160 oh, whatever and settled in Connecticut, right? Like that's the like I'm on that side. I'm related to like Johnny Appleseed and uh, 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 Benedict Arnold. I'm probably related to Benedict Arnold. Uh, if, if, you, if you must know. Oh, and Carrie Nation, so, if you know who that is. Okay, so really, you're an Englishman, which I'm explains your sense for hard facts and your goodwill to clarity and reason that so often makes you appear so English and un-German. Which you I, see, I'm, I'm half English and half Czech, therefore. Yeah, okay. So what does that mean? Very, you're very un-German. <laughs> That's what it is, Deep. yeah. Deeply, find, deeply un-German. Did you find? So I, I found this part about the Schopenhauer being appearing so English and un-German. Uh, I found that pretty hilarious. With considering my professor is English and a Schopenhauer scholar, and uh, he mentions all the time the what Nietzsche says about the Englishman and his love for pleasure and whatnot which I think is, it's about, you know, John Stuart Mill and all the utilitarian stuff. But yeah, I found that pretty funny. Which you, you got to get, you know, Nietzsche's weird sense of humor. It's, it's that's clearly a joke. I don't know. I thought also the fact, hard facts in Schopenhauer. I don't, I don't know about that. But clarity, I, I guess he, he like strives for that. But yeah, I don't know. Well 
the hard fact of everyone being part of a universal will. <laughs> yeah. Everybody knows about that. <laughs> Which, yeah, Nietzsche makes the point that you can't really indemonstrable doctrine, yeah, of one will. But, okay, so, yeah, this part was pretty interesting considering, uh, so first he lists a bunch of, he says basically, all these German followers of Schopenhauer, you know, what are they usually first taking over from their master? Um, so that's basically the question that kind of defines these, you know, three pages or whatnot. So he goes off on these things and first says, you know, this first list is, well, then what he'll say is, no, not these. These do not enchant. Um, so one of the things I found that was interesting that does not enchant is the instrumental nature of the intellect and the unfreedom of the will. Uh, that's basically what Nietzsche expands on uh, just in the next book or later in this book, you know. Uh, the instrumental nature of the intellect is all the interesting stuff he says, you know, basically like 10 pages later. So he's, he's still taking on this stuff from Schopenhauer, the unfreedom of the will, he's, he's still questioning those things. Uh, the a priori nature of the causal law. So that one's kind of complex because he's, he, so he uh, questions cause and effect, you know, in that one section. But then at the same time, uh, Schopenhauer kind of does that, but also not. He, he does that in about the, the transcendental, you know, world, but the empirical world is totally deterministic for Schopenhauer. So it's, it's interesting to see that. And then all the stuff where he says, no, the things that actually, you know, seduce people into them are these, uh, the excesses and vices of the philosopher. So that's interesting. But then the part that was, I found really interesting was this very last part where he's talking about Wagner. And he says, basically, as his disciples, you know, what, what do we do? How do we remain faithful to him? Uh, by seeing what is true and original in him, by remaining faithful to ourselves and what is true and original in us. He's basically given a kind of, uh, you know, this uh, Deleuzian idea about how to read Nietzsche, where you select, but you select in a way that is kind of essential to the, the basic tendency of thought of that person. And then from there, you can kind of select within that person and their thinking. So I think this right here is a good, this is a good example of how we can interpret Nietzsche himself according to his own writing about how to interpret Wagner and Schopenhauer and whatnot. So this is very interesting. I think this could be some kind of like a, almost a methodological hermeneutic, her, hermeneutic key to, to Nietzsche that is written by Nietzsche that we can use to um, say, okay, these parts of Nietzsche, what is actually sort of against Nietzsche's own thinking at times? How can we give a kind of imminent critique of Nietzsche when he he says stuff that is, uh, well, at least that I don't agree with. So, would you, I, I was sort of distracted there. Would, would you point out again the, that passage that you were, or the? Yeah, so it's it's on page ninety eight. It's kind of at the end of that section on Schopenhauer. So he's talking about Wagner at that point, and he's basically saying that, oh, well, there's <laughs> this part that uh. That he says earlier, uh, Wagner let himself be misled by Hegel. That, that's kind of funny. So he said he, he's basically saying his Schopenhauer stuff was all very, uh, not very authentic. That basically Wagner is really actually very different from Schopenhauer. In it says basically, okay, what can we like about Wagner given he has all this ridiculous stuff? Um, He's saying, yeah, 
basically in what is true and original in him. And he goes and says, basically what is true and original in him is this idea of remaining faithful to ourselves and what is true and original in us. So it's basically how can we use these ideas in this creative manner uh, instead of just simply, you know, you know, the will to truth is the impotence of the will to create. That basically, you know, what do we do when we can't simply use something and to create our own ideas? Uh, you know, we just will then for just this kind of stale uh, historical accuracy or whatnot. But I think what he's saying is, no, basically, let's take ideas and see what is useful for our own life and our own, uh, especially in the aspect of creation. So I think there's always this kind of impetus towards creation that Nietzsche is sort of uh, leading us on to. And I think that's a good way that we can apply to Nietzsche himself. Uh, at least that's my interpretation, which is somewhat uh, you're very as well. I was going to say you're very Deleuzian interpretation. How dare you? Yes, yes, exactly. I'm guilty as charged in that sense. So, is, is that original in me then? If I'm just going with like Deleuze's own original thoughts, but then wanting to do it in a different way? I don't. I don't know. There's so much difference now. I, I'm I'm stuck. So, yeah, the impetus to create is gone. Yeah. Um, yeah, so basically, how can we, you know, grow and blossom from ourselves with someone else's thinking? It's a very interesting idea because, you know, so much of academic philosophy can easily get stuck in this historicizing that never sees anything useful about what these people, you know, whether it's somebody who's very like ancient philosophy, like Plato, Aristotle, whatever, it's all just, you know, something that's just this historical curiosity. And I think he's saying instead, you know, how do we actually make this relevant to ourselves for our own creation? That there's something about the idea of kind of mining for gold in another thinker's thought. Um, in order to create for yourself something that's original to you. So yeah, okay, I'm just repeating myself by now, so I'll shut up. Okay, oh. I, sorry, never. I, whatever. Okay. Uh, um. What's up? Uh, okay. Well, I uh, I came into this. Um, I I agree with you, Nevit. Like what you said about like that section, uh, the la like the last part of book two, being just him ragging on Germans and like. A part of me really was like, all right, yeah, the German language, I'm sure it seems to have gotten very militarized. That's, that's, a, that's a disaster. And I was like, oh, maybe I can relate this to what it's like to be an English speaker, I guess. I don't know. I didn't really care that much, but I liked it in another way because I didn't have to take notes because I wasn't reading any profound shit that I needed to write down in a note. I was just like, the German language got worse over time and I was like okay <laughs> and then I, I would write down his pithy little like Germans tolerate themselves <laughs> like that's pretty funny <laughs> but um yeah in section uh, in book three I think a lot of um a lot of ideas that and I'm not saying that his critiques of Germans aren't wonderful and profound and beautiful and full of wealth and whatever but <laughs> they didn't they didn't hook me in the same way that uh, the stuff in book three did. Uh, and and the, the stuff in book three made me have a couple thoughts that I, I kind of wanted to, I don't know, kind of just open up with or like kind of put forward because Nevit and I have been talking after, like we we're doing the meaning of life thing. And after class uh, or in that class, we've been reading uh, gay science, like la a later part of the book. But um, during class discussions, I'll say some, some, 
stuff I barely mean and then uh, Nivet will question me and then I'll you know and he'll say some stuff he barely means and then we'll both you know after class kind of talk about it really rigorously and then shake hands and you know <laughs> go our separate ways but uh in doing so we, we've just been talking about um kind of Nietzsche's will to power um and the the I guess the the differences the 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 differences both large and small between hegelian and nietzschean logic you know um and i've got some thoughts that i i think this the section the book three the early the first part of book three before he starts talking about morality because then he's in the second half of the book three thing where he just starts talking about morality and that's one thing that's all very interesting but he's really talking about this like epistemology cosmology at the beginning of book three, it seems. And so it was like, he was really answering some of you and I's or some of Nevin and I's um, questions in a way. And through looking at that, I, I, I read a few things and I uh, have some, some tentative uh, ideas that are, that are um, kind of helping me move forward. Uh, so I had this, I, I read this Hegelian thing recently um, by this guy named Robert Brandom uh, or something. Yeah, Brandom. I might have said his first name wrong because I don't remember anything. But uh, Brandom wrote a book called The Spirit of Trust or A Spirit of Trust, a reading of Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. And it's a big analytic reading or like an analytic like translation in a way of Hegel's logic or of the logic that's in the Phenomenology of Spirit. Um, and he gives like pretty direct like analogs to Hegelian ideas uh, like, oh, a determinate negation. That's like, a, here's, it's this sort of analytic term or whatever. But I just read an excerpt from it because I was curious because a person in my in his Discord group recommended it to me. And he, and he wrote out this formula that I really, really, um, I thought was cool. Uh, and he said, okay, so the basic formula for uh, singularity versus multiplicity is something like uh, one divides into two or two unite into one. Uh, and then he referenced Mao. He said, Mao enumerated this when he said, let it not be that one divides into two, but that two unite into one. Um, and and uh, he said the Hegelian inversion of this would be the opposite. Uh, he said the Hegelian progressive, the progressive Hegelian standpoint would be two divide into one. <laughs> And the conservative response would be one unites into two, uh, which would just be a total reversal. So the, the, the way that he described two dividing into one, and this is kind of how, this is a conception that I had of the, the Nietzsche situation. And, and then it changed and I'm gonna kind of take you all through that little journey I had. So I, I thought, okay, so the Hegelian progressive stance is two divided into one, meaning two opposing poles Two, two discrete entities in tension, right? That's, some, that's one interpretation of the coincidence of opposites, which I think is um, something that the Hegelian project generally tends to move away from, even though that seems like it's very Jungian and like kind of new age. Uh, I think, I don't think Hegel really is into it, but basically two divided to one means you take these two opposed poles in like tension, like, masculinity and femininity that's a good example um because hegel talks a lot about sexuation uh, and sexuality of subjectivity so uh masculine and feminine masculinity and femininity are seen as these two opposed poles that stand in a tension that uh oh yeah i mean i don't know where heraclitus stands on the issue but um i i think that like Another another way to word the new age comment about the two, the things standing in tension, creating the, or producing change or reality, it's like a pagan cosmology. It's like this pagan cosmology of the yin and yang, as this as this um, yeah yeah that's funny <laughs> in this in this you know opposition. But uh, to be fair, also I mean like like there's a lot of. Um, like I, I, yin and yang is a very, like I'm I'm miss I'm I'm misapplying the term yin and yang. Yin and yang is actually a progressive bifurcation, in the terms of the Tao. It's a progressive bifurcation, and that's um, like a big point in Lacan. But I'm just using it as like a basic like picture example. Like two crazy wild forces, lightness and darkness. There are two wolves inside of you. You get you know so 
you take these two opposed poles and instead of letting them stay as these two supposedly opposed poles in this playing field, right, in tension that is producing these um, irregularities or these kind of uh, undulations that produce change or difference or like, uh, you know, the, the emanation of reality or whatever, you, you, sub, you take that, you transpose the antagonism between the two poles. There's an antagonism between those two poles, right? You transpose that antagonism for the imminent antagonism of the field which generated the two entities, meaning that the, the, there is an antagonism that precedes the, the two poles that are in antagonism. There is a fundamental facet of reality that is antagonism that precedes any entities in antagonism whatsoever. All right. So I, and that's just like a basic, that's a basic sort of description of the notion of coincidence of opposites under the Hegelian frame. Uh, so uh, this imminent antagonism of the field, two divides into one, you see, oh, so then one unites into two would be this, um, this imminent feature of antagonism. And another thing about like, that's a good example of this instead of masculinity and femininity is like class struggle, for example, uh, class struggle for Hegel. Well, I don't, I don't know how much H Hegel commented on some economics, but he wasn't too, you know, uh, class struggle, at least if you take like, like sort of um, like a Marxist, like extension of this logic, uh, which I, I, I do. Um, uh, class struggle is, a, is an antagonism that precedes any classes. You don't need classes to have class struggle. Class struggle is an imminent antagonism that is embedded into or, or co-extensive with any sort of social edifice as we conceive of it. Um, so, okay, see, yeah, the, this field of antagonisms, this field of, never, you're kind of seeing where I'm going with this. So, <laughs> I, uh, this, this, this field of class struggle, or this field of struggle, this field of antagonism, it says, you know, uh, one unites into two in the sense that, uh, yes, yes, Sean, exactly. It's class struggle that makes the classes, not the other way around. That's a, yes, exactly the that whole that like imminent internal antagonism is replaced with a much cleaner much simpler set of opposed entities of of squeaky clean opposed entities duking it out that are uh, in themselves uh, at least in some sense consistent or coherent as a, at least a, at the very least a fiction uh, so you have these at least co consistent or at least coherent entities that are duking it out rather than accepting or confronting the, um, the sort of imminent problem of antagonism. And my initial reading of Nietzsche, or at least what the kind of thought that's gone through my reading thus far, and this is where I think some frustration came or some disagreements between Nevin and I came from because I, I, I don't agree with this position that I held, and at least now, uh, it's that I, thought, I felt like Nietzsche was taking up that position of, 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 of one uniting into two, where the field of imminent antagonism was being kind of um, overlooked for this this battle of wills to power in this field of, of a million wills to power, you know, that are all kind of their own coherent or consistent entities um, vying for, for supremacy. Uh, and then I had a, I had a, a question actually to, to Mount Nevit, but um, I, I'm gonna do that later. It's about the anthropomorphizing of the cosmos that um, he gets into in that section where he mentions de-deification. I had a question about that in the world of power that I'll, I'll ask you in a second after I enumerate something. And it's, I think there are like three basic points that I can see now that are that I think Hegel and Nietzsche agree on. And then I think they're like, there's three points that they disagree on. Uh, so the three points where they agree, I think, is that there's there's nothing beyond or behind the image of a thing except for what we put there. There's nothing beyond or behind images except what we put there. That's like, I think something Hegel and Nietzsche can definitely agree on. Another thing they agree on is uh, oppositions arise from a field, a pre-existent field that harbors opposition within itself. Uh, that gives rise to these entities rather than the entities giving rise to the antagonism. 
Uh, so, which is why I, I was saying, Nevitt, I don't agree with that previous reading I had. So the third is that arbitration, arbitrary decision-making is at the core of our endeavoring for knowledge and of our dividing of entities and of our slicing up of the cosmos into cause and effect. He sees cause and effect as an arbitrary split. So they, they both agree that there's nothing beyond or behind images. There's an opposition that arises from a field and arbitration is at the core of our endeavoring of, or of our dividing of categories. Those are three things that I think they fundamentally agree on. Uh, but I think that they disagree in, in three ways that are complementary to that list. First, I think that they think that the logic uh, uh, of the of the the nothingness behind appearance, that nothingness. I think that they disagree on the logic of that nothingness because I think Hegel sees that as essence, um, but I don't think Nietzsche sees it as essence. I think Nietzsche. I, I don't think Nietzsche sees the the the. I don't think Nietzsche sees it as reasonable to argue that the things that we place in the void of subjectivity behind appearance as the things contra to appearance are beholden to the logic of essence. I don't think Nietzsche thinks that. I think that Nietzsche does not think that the things we put into the place of nothingness, I think he does not, he says that's just a creation of human willing. And that in a sense does not, that makes it not an essence. <laughs> and like, that's a problem for him. Uh, but I think Hegel would say it is an essence. It's it's essence qua appearance. It's es it's appearance as essence in a way. Uh, so the second thing is the nature or the logic of that field. Now I know you guys are talking about it in the chat, but I'm not reading it because it'll give me a headache and interrupt my my thinking. Um, so uh, well, an essential care. Well, I guess a necessary characteristic for a thing to be what it is uh, would be a definition of essence. But so the nature or the logic of this field, this imminent field that produces those um, those oppositions or that retains those oppositions within it, depending on who you're talking to. The, I think the nature or the logic of that field is different for Hegel and Nietzsche. But I'm not entirely sure how. And I guess we could talk about it, and that would be productive. But the third thing is that the arbitrary dividing or endeavoring of the individual or of the subject within substance, I, I think that that logic of arbitration is different from Nietzsche and Hegel. I think that Nietzsche sees it as a, as a necessary, um, or not a necessary, but a, a, a foundational um, self-deception, a self-deception that, that throws out all of our capacity to know and we only say that we know things when it's when it's useful for us um, or at least it has some sort of um, functionality in our survival or in our will in our willing uh, at least it serves some purpose for our will uh, but I think that Hegel basically I think that Hegel sees the logic of the arbitration of the arbitrary decision as being inside of a Mobius strip, as taking place within the shape of a Mobius strip in a way, if I could go to the topology. But I think that Nietzsche sees it, it much more in a, in a rhizomatic sense, this series of arbitrary decisions being made and cutting into each other and, and, and vying for power and pushing past one another. <clears throat> uh, and and to, to, to be more specific about Hegel's notion of the Mobius strip, I don't think that it's a single Mobius strip. I think it's more like a like a weird object called a lemnisate, this this like series of infinite Mobius strips that fall into one another. But that's a different topic for another time. Uh, so that's my basic description or my understanding right now as to what's the same about Nietzsche and Hegel and what's different about Nietzsche and Hegel. At least that's most obvious to me. And then the the, the last thing that I wanted to add, I wanted to mount a question kind of to Nevit. And it was that um, it seems like in this section uh, 109, in section 109, he talks about um, the world is not an organism nor a machine. He says that the world is not an organism, nor is it a machine. And he, he follows this up by saying the total character of the world is one of chaos. He says the total character of the world is chaos. I think Hegel would be explicit in saying the total character of the world is antagonism. But, uh, you know, that's up for us to kind of get down to the nitty gritty on. So... He then says we should complete our de-deification of nature and involved in all of this deification is all of our perception of splits and causes and effects and oppositions. As we, I, think, I think that Nietzsche would say that looking at, at the world as something other than chaos 
as rather this um, antagonistic thing, I think he would say that that is a, an anthropomorphizing of the world. I think he would say you're putting like a human, a human experience into like this broader universal frame. You're saying the entire universe is based on antagonisms, but what's an antagonism for something that, that, that can't be antagonized, you know, like he would, he would, I don't know how he would phrase it, but he would probably argue that antagonism as the, as the total character of everything is a bit anthropomorphic uh, and we should de-deify our reality. But then I mount this question and it's if antagonism is out because of its anthropomorphizing character of experience, I would imagine that will to power is out too. I, I, I would, and it seemed to me when I read this that, that he would probably say like, yeah, will to power is not a cosmic force. And then at other points, he would say that it is a cosmological um, uh, element or, or constitutive term. But in this de deifying thing, he's, it seems to him me that he's saying that like this, that, and the other thing are just totally not applicable to the universe. And, and, and so I felt like, okay, well, maybe he would, he would say antagonism is just my, my human Im imaginings could I mount the same thing and say the will to power is is um, is something of an anthropomorphizing of experience? But I don't know. What do you guys think? Um, so, you know, one thing <clears throat> Nietzsche says uh, some places, and I'm having a hard time keeping track of remembering where, some of the things I thought were in the genealogy of morality I've discovered are actually in this book. So my memory's failing, but um, he gives some indications that the will to power he acknowledges is an interpretation, um, but one that he thinks, so, you know, there's places where he says everything's interpretation. And so there's places where he seems to suggest that the will to power as the sort of fundamental ontological character of everything is an interpretation, but one that he thinks is more, well, I guess two things. That seems like the two criteria Nietzsche has is, one is it matches the data better in some sort of general sense. In other words, it's a better explanation of the real. And, and two, uh, it is more healthy in the sense of what he considers to be he the, the healthy, human ex you know, healthy human existence. But, but he, he's, he's, you know, very hesitant to make dogmatic statements. So as far as, you know, is it anthropomorphic? You know, he might say that's the only choice we have and all we can do is make it as little anthropomorphic as possible. So for example, in Beyond Good and Evil 36, which is this famous passage, it's one of the few places in his published, I mean, he, he talks about this a lot in the unpublished stuff, but one of the few places in his published works where he explicitly talks about the sort of internal character of the will to power. And he says, we have to make this experiment as to whether you could reduce all causality to will to power. And the reason we would want to make this experience is, or make this experiment is because we have direct, it's sort of almost a phenomenological kind of a move. We have direct experience with will to power in our own psychic existence, in our own physiological existence, because we can feel the tensions of these competing forces within our own minds and even within our own bodies. And so it's anthropomorphic in a way, but in a way it's sort of phenomenological in that the only, the only place you can start authentically is from experience in a deep sort of way as a, not, not the empiricist sort of experience. Well, I mean, I, I, in some ways it may be a radical uh, empiricism, but not assuming that there is some external world that has this empirical character, but beginning, in, you know, grounding empiricism in directly in my immediate experience. And in Beyond Good and Evil 36, he says, we have to make this experiment to see if we can explain what we, you know, he, and there basically he also says there is no such thing as cause and effect in terms of there is a cause that is distinct from the effect. That all, all we perceive of cause and effect is, you know, this is partially my interpretation, is these tensions in this field 
of will, will to power. And then, you know, because of the way our minds work, we sort of abstract these entities that are that have these cause and effect relationships. But what's really going on is this, you know, again, I think of it as this, like this field of will to power that we have an immediate experiential access to. And so in terms of is it anthropomorphic, you know, I guess in a sense it is, but I, I think, you know, he would, I think he might say that anything a human being says is going to be necessarily anthropomorphic. The only thing you can do is, is minimize the degree to which you reduce things to, you know, to, to the human dimension, but you can't, you can't get, I mean, I can't leave my human, my humanness. I can't, I can't get out of it. So I think that would be one answer. I can't remember what all the questions you asked. Um, with regard to this particular section 109, I, I, think, I think of it as kind of a uh, rejection in general of one of teleology and two, a rejection of um, a particular kind of teleology, namely providence, divine providence. And so I think his fundamental He's taking something like a, a Darwinian view in that all there are, all there is is shit happening. And the shit happening fundamentally is this, this flexing field of power that generates these temporary structures, stable structures of will to power that then eventually collapse. And that's all there is. And, you know, trying to inject teleological things like purposes and goals and aims and and um, stuff like that is that is sort of the unacceptable unacceptable anthropomorphism um, you know and I guess like we could you know I'm, I'm trying to think off the top of my head so why is that unacceptable but the will to power is not um, I could probably come up with an answer but I'm not going to try right now but I think he's trying to remove so like when he says the living is only a form of what is dead and a very rare form I think, you know, again, what I, I think of him saying is that living things are just structured forms of will to power, and dead things are just structured forms of will to power. And sure, there's differences, but um, ultimately, it's not, it's not like there is some magical divine spark, you know, for example, that makes a human being uh, a live rational being, but no, a human being is just as natural as, as a rock or a bug. Um, and so I think, it, I think of it as primarily, you know, an argument against teleology, but I, I do agree that I think Nietzsche would also say that probably, if I understood what you mean by essence, that essences are artificial. And it, you know, I think of this flux of the will to power as kind of a Heraclitian thing. What, what's, you know, what's really going on is this shifting, changing these structures of, of will that we have some intuition of through our own existence. But what we experience in the, to call them appearances, what we experience is what our rational faculties are able to grasp. And so, you know, the rational mind in and which is to a large degree a function of you know herd society, our rational minds, in order to grasp things and manipulate things and use things and survive in this world, the rational mind has to carve up this flux into discrete entities that we can that can represent kinds of things. And, and that is, as he says, it's it was a real, it was a good thing that that happened for, for survivability and for reproduction and for utility. But don't think that's what's the, that don't think that's the fundamental nature of things. The fundamental nature of things is not a bunch of essences that are somehow linked together in some sort of dialectical relation. The real thing, as it were, is just this flux. But, um, and so I think in a sense, there is, even in, in this late Nietzsche, there is sort of an appearance um, reality distinction, but it's, it's, it's that, you know, the distinction is between, I think, the flux, and which we have some sort of vague intuitions of, and there's other places where he, maybe in Twilight of the Idols, where he, he talks about, you know, you can kind of get these 
these vague senses for, for what's happening in this flux sometimes. But mostly where we live is in this world of, quote, appearances. But the appearances are exactly the rational reduction of the world. You know, the reduction of the world into categories and things and essences. But I think he, he does, I, you know, if, if, if Hegel is vested ultimately in there being something like real essences, I think you, would, I think you, were, you were right that Nietzsche would deny that. So, you know, in that, uh, for example, the, the short essay, uh, Truth, I can't remember what the name of it is, in an extra moral sense, um, you know, he says the way we come up with the idea of leaf, for example, the, the essence of a leaf is by looking at a whole bunch of things that kind of look kind of like each other and then forgetting about all the differences between them. But there are really no, there is no such thing as leaf. There's just little things, you know, and that have some vague similarity to them. And if you abstract all the differences and hang on to the similarities, boom, there's your essence, but it's not a real essence. It's just a, it's, it's the way that the rational mind has carved up the world into a certain kind of way. And I mean, I think it's, he would probably think it's conceivable that you could, I mean, I, I again, I'm getting sort of the flavor of Heidegger here almost. There's, there's, it's conceivable that you could have different epochs in, in which human uh, being carved reality, reality up in significantly different ways. And so what is, constitutes a thing, and particularly kinds of things or so-called essences, might vary significantly uh, you know, in, in certain times and places. But anyway, I don't know if that's what you're looking for, but that's kind of my, my reflections on what I can remember. Sean, were you gonna speak or you had your hand raised? So. Yeah, I had some thoughts, but I, I, I was wondering if, if Hunter wanted to respond first or um, also I'm, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm having trouble collecting all my thoughts because I think Nevitt talked about a lot of things and I thought they were all very interesting. And I was, I was kind of hoping uh, Hunter would respond first just so I would have a little bit of a refresher. But I also wanted to speak to what he was saying. I was going to add one thing um, because it's just right off of what Nevitt was just saying with regard to, um, you know, uh, seeing things that kind of in a state of flux and, you know, it, it reminds, well, first it reminds me a bit of Adorno. I'm going to show you how I got there. Um, my question was, if things are in a state of flux, flux, how would you know that unless you didn't initially identify things and notice those, those identify identifications were faulty. Like if, if you, if you, if you just, you know, uh, proscribe if you if you don't allow identification to get off the ground to begin with then how do you understand what flux is right so it's only because we've imposed identifications on things and then sh shown those identifications to to have shortcomings that we then have amended our model to now now we have a, a more sophisticated model and it reminds me again uh, you know adorno being uh, very strong on on non-identity uh, against hegel's you know strong identity thesis or, his reading of, of Hegel anyway. But Ador Adorno talks about non-identity of the, the things never, the, the concepts never fully con um, cover the thing. The thing is never fully subsumed by the concept. There's always a remainder. And so identification never is complete. But he also stresses that we can only think in terms of identifying things under concepts. So on the one hand, we have to think about these things. So we have to use identification. But on the other hand, we can't take these identifications to be reflective of the way things actually are, you know. So again, in, in, in that way, he's kind of hearkening to the, to the Kantian move, you know. Um, there's, a, you know, we can't we can't just assume that because we think this way that the way this is the way things are. So I think Adorno takes it on the chin, and I think Nietzsche also is kind of making the case that we, to, at some level, you have to identify, you have to use concept, you have to do, you have to call this a leaf. In order for us to have survived in this world as a biological species, we needed to be able to point to things and say, that is a good mushroom to eat, and that is a bad mushroom to eat. And so we've had to identify these things. But only when we get to a certain level of identification and sophistication of system of identifications, and then see the problems with those, can we move beyond that to a higher stage where now we recognize things are in flux. But I want to say like, this isn't recognizing that things are actually in flux isn't supposed to knock out the whole 
process of identification to begin with. This isn't one of those where you get to the top of the ladder and then you kick away the ladder. Um, you just kind of recognize that the ladder was always a construct, that you don't have to kick it away, if that makes sense. Yes, the, that reminds, this whole thing, of course, reminds me of Bergson and how he has a, pretty much the same idea. Um, so the thing is, so Schopenhauer has also this a similar idea that basically uh, the will to life actually has power over cognition and the intellect and you know it it carves up our thinking along those lines of the will so that's i think where nietzsche is originally getting these things from but uh, okay so bergson he says something pretty similar to um Eric, you're just talking about Adorno, correct? Yeah, so, and I think that's also a good point that, you know, this isn't some kind of Wittgenstein thing where you kick the ladder away. And Bergson makes that point too. So he says basically we need to have a, a kind of dialectic between the intellect and kind of going back to intuition and, and getting a sense of the movement of things. So, but I think that's a good point that basically, you know, we were so we're so stuck in these these epochs of of carving up different identities in order to kind of go along with other members of our species and and whatnot that it, it becomes we get you know lost in these identities, and then the thing is eventually they, for whatever reason they don't work out, and we realize that oh these are actually pretty contingent. You can carve these things up in all these different ways. That's where he talks about, you know, you can have different ideas that both seem to work, yet they're kind of opposed to each other. So that's how we came to, you know, for a long time, people were uh, relatively isolated. You know, there was a mass media and stuff like that. And people could actually have the illusion that basically their laws were eternal and, you know, given by God and whatnot. Um, and then eventually people started you know, uh, we had these better capacities to travel and communicate and whatnot. And people started to understand that, oh my God, there's other cultures that do other things. They see these things as reasonable that are opposed to our ideas of, you know, what is right, what is, what is reason, what is all these other things. So then there's the possibility of, you know, this kind of relativism between those two things. But uh, I think what he's, so by pointing back to this flux, it's seeing, okay, that's, you know, this generative ground where these things are coming from. And, you know, we're carving things up for life in order to, is that's basically the, the conditions of the possibility of us living at all is that we select these things. And I think Bergson does a really good job of explaining how that process happens explaining why we need these immobilities in order to to act and uh so he does it with perception he goes into detail about how perception basically requires uh, a simplification of things and a relative so basically like a, a certain quality like a color it's really uh trillions of vibrations that get condensed into a single quality that looks like just, oh, red or whatever. Um, that's how you, it gets uh, immobilized into some kind of a quality and perception, but then um, the intellect does the same thing, but in a kind of new level of intensity where it then takes those concepts and, and solidifies them even more into immobilities so that it could have this kind of grip on things. And then from there, you basically get, yeah, the laws of logic, identity. So basically, yeah, logic, you know, Aristotle, you have the law of identity. If A doesn't equal A, you have no logic. And I don't, I'm not sure uh, if there's any kind of a standardized, you know, formal logic that doesn't assume that that's how you have to assume that in order to have 
some kind of logical system that you can apply to anything. So, yeah, I think he, for people to get that, to see past that, um, I think that was a pretty revolutionary thing for people to eventually encounter. And they, they wouldn't have, probably would not have seen it uh, unless we had uh, basically this kind of confrontation of cultures with where they had to suddenly face their own relativity and that's where he's coming from i think but yeah uh this is it's so brixonian that it's just uh it it just like hurts to not think of it in that sense but i i don't think bergson actually read nietzsche um but i think he read schopenhauer but anyways yeah, that's my that's my take on. I don't think that uh, Hegel or that uh, Bergson read Hegel either. Even though when we were reading Bergson's Creative Evolution, I was like, "Ah, oh, this is you know, this is great." Uh, yes, um, Nevit, you taking a shit this morning will essentially be the case for this morning as far as your current awareness or elaboration of the meaning of this morning is concerned, it will eternally be the case that that happened. Uh, and the meaning of that event might change and your conception of that event might change. Uh, and your belief in its eternality or its essential essentiality. Well, it, essential means that it, 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 this is like the basic structure of everything that's rational is real and everything that's real is rational. Like, I will write the letter I, and it will be a straight line on a piece of paper. Uh, and and I, I will do it. Think, uh, basically, and all Hegel's saying, it's very modest. It's just, if I could summarize what Hegel's saying by saying that there is an essence to things, it's that stuff happens a certain way. That's all he's saying. Things happen a certain way, and they don't happen a different way. Like, I'm not on fire right now. I, I very well could be, and I could be deluded, I suppose. But my, as far as my, uh, hey, you know, as far as long as we're in the realm of uh, intuitively opening ourselves to our wills, right? And engaging in this phenomenological enterprise of knowledge, phenomenologically, and as far as my will is concerned, as of right now, in this concrete instantiation of my being, I am essentially not on fire. My essence right now is not being on fire. My essence right now is believing and thinking a series of things. My essence right now is apparently open to a set of phenomenological apparatuses and datum that are buffeting me and changing my perception and my understanding at every moment and my, my conventions that I use to write things like the letter I or the Cyrillic letter N or whatever it is that Sean wrote that I can't read. Uh, the <laughs> It's the Cyrillic letter for I. Oh, well, great. Uh, <laughs> if I were a Russian man, uh, I could say that seems to dissolve the meaningfulness of essence. Well, I think that's the thing. I think that, I mean, if you're, if you're talking about essence as if it's a, as if it's a, well, actually, no, here's the thing. I, I don't think so because, because if we're talking about meaning, if we're talking about me like the meaning of something, and if we're gonna talk about meaning as if it's just how somebody feels about something at the time, or or the like Dylan is saying, the state or the condition of the thing, like yes, basically, okay. Yes. The whole, the whole, okay. Chase actually asked me a question recently and he said, is Hegelian logic like this thing where you can um, like take a series of variables in a formula and apply different values into those variables and get a consistent or predictable result? Like a logic, right? You know, like a modus tollens, modus ponens kind of thing. I, I said at the time, I was like, ah, I don't really know. I'll have to do some uh, some looking. And I've come to a complete, or not a complete, but a, but a, like a like a re a big a big 180 from where I was uh, recently. Uh, and that where I am now is to say, no, not at all. And in no universe will it ever be the case 
that at least for, from Hegel's standpoint, I mean, I am so in love with essences and absolutes, right? Uh, the, the Hegelian logic is not something that can have a series of variables that are interchangeable with different sets of content. What you're asking is, is there a consistent form for Hegelian logic that can take in any number of different content and still operate in the same formal way? The answer is no. The, the big, like a fundamental feature of Hegelian logic is the permanent irresolvable entanglement between form and content. Form and content are permanently, inextricably linked up forever. So that form and content being married means that it is not so gauche of me, as some may assume, <laughs> to say that my present, my present essence, my concrete universality <laughs> is to not be on fire, or to at least believe that I am not on fire. It is essentially the case right now that I believe that I am not on fire. Uh, and that's, yeah. Anyway. Part of, oh, go ahead, Nevin. Part of, part of how I want to respond to that, and I, I have a tendency to read, like, a, I think a platonic conception into every time I see an instance of essence. And, so I think a thing that I do have to contend with is just like there, are, there, there is more than just the platonic interpretation of what an essence is, or at least what that word has come to mean. But I, I, I do think that what is, what is disturbing about essences, particularly in the way that I think Nietzsche wants to stand in opposition to them, is their tendency to delude us into thinking that we have a clearer understanding of something than we actually have, if that sort of makes sense. Like maybe we can use this word essence to refer to something that that Nietzsche would agree, you know, exists and is true in, in sort of the way that you're doing. But I think the thing that's very dangerous about the concept of essence in the, in the way that Nietzsche is trying to warn us off from a certain kind of anthropomorphization is kind of the thing I was jokingly trying to point to with the with the reference to the the Cyrillic I, right? It's that there is this assumption that there is a, a fundamental relationship between this this character that you've made, uh, I, the sound that I'm making right now, I, uh, a particular meaning that is associated with that that sound, I, um, a, right, a historical process that has led to that uh, particular sound uh, being present in particular words uh, under particular kind of circumstances, etc., 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 and what. Nietzsche wants us to note this. This is what I'm. This is my understanding of him, and I'm, I'm curious to see if Nevit agrees with this. Is just the fact that those connections are both arbitrary and uh, in flux, right? Like that that letter I can come to be pronounced different ways under different circumstances. It can that character I can be used to mean different things in different alphabets or to imply different sounds. And so, yes, if you look at a particular instance of the, my usage of the sound I or my drawing of the letter I or whatever at a particular time, uh, taking into account, uh, you know, the fact that I'm the person indicating this I and I have a particular purpose, then you, yeah, you can narrow it down enough to where it will have a consistent value or consistent meaning. But, I, uh, the, you know, there's two things Nietzsche doesn't like about that. First of all, that's a very difficult piece of information to get access to beyond the circumstances into like that that brought it about right like uh, uh uh you know every time i'm looking at these you know greek translations or whatever i'm 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 not actually looking at letter i's right or i'm looking at letter i's that aren't the letter i essentially because a translation has occurred um and the other thing is is that nietzsche wants us to you know sort of favor creative misinterpretation rather than uh, simply trying to trudge along and always consistently have the correct interpretation if it is more interesting and more useful and, and cooler to propose later on that in fact Hunter was on fire during this meeting. Um, and that, that does a lot of work in terms of us trying to describe what was happening in this meeting in an interesting and productive way, even if it happened to not be true, quote unquote, then, then uh, uh, we can, you know, right, as far as Nietzsche is concerned, happily declare that Hunter was in fact on fire during this meeting. Um, and the fact that he was burning and screaming and, uh, and smoke was rising off of him was, uh, I don't know, so avant-garde and uh, impressive. I mean, it was really punk metal. Um, if that happens, then uh, then that should be pursued. 
and any kind of like slavish adherence to the essence of what happened in this meeting at this time on this day with these particular, eh, you know, eh, screw it. So that's my interpretation of Nietzsche and his reaction to the question of essence. I, I'm curious if, if, uh, if Nevitt agrees. I, I think so. I mean, I, I hadn't thought through those implications, but that seems to, uh, seems to fit with the way I think about it. Um, you know, I was, I was trying to think of trying to apply that leaf example to like the letter I, um, you know, if you, if you put a bunch of straight marks on a paper, whether they're, whether it's an I or whether it's, you know, you're counting like one, two, three, four, five, it depends on what you're doing at the time. And it depends on who's involved and, and all of that. And I mean, I see Hunter is saying, yeah, and that's why it makes it essence. And I'm like, no, that's why it's not an essence. It's just what people happen to be seeing at the moment. So, you know, if I, you know, there's this common phenomena that I'm sure all of you have experienced for, for me, it happens a lot with faces, um, sometimes with words, but when I look, I, I have this problem during Zen meditation, if I'm sitting and I'm looking out of the room, that whatever I'm looking at, all of a sudden, all these faces start showing up. And so, like, the, the one room where, you, where I used to do that at the Zen Center, it was a wood floor. And all of a sudden, all these faces start showing up in the wood grain. And then they replace the, they, they put a, a rug over the floor, not because of me. And then all of a sudden, I start seeing all these faces in this rug pattern. And so it's like my, my mind just wants to find faces. And, you know, I find it very distracting, which is why it was a problem. But um, so it's like, you know, there aren't any essences of faces there. It's just my mind is kind of carving up this stuff in that kind of way and finding these things. But they're not, it's not like there's anything actually there. And if you look at, like, you know, human faces, you know, I think Nietzsche would say every single face, is, as he would say everything, well, in one, sometimes he would say everything is an individual because there is no, there are no universals. There are just individuals that have common features. But then I think he would take a step further and say, there aren't even individuals, there's just this flux. And so even because even the, the, the idea of an individual is also an imposition. You know, it's a it's a universal being imposed on on what's happening. So um, so yeah, I think I mean if, you know what you what you said made made a lot of sense to me, and you know the way that it, it it could be highly variable, like the letters or whatever could be highly variable, depending on you know the pul the person, the culture, the language, historical epoch, or whatever. So I'm guessing I, I have a, I actually have a question for Hunter, but I'm thinking Hunter wants to probably respond. Ah, oh, I just was like getting something out from between my teeth, and I hurt my gums with my fingernail, and now I'm upset. But I'm gonna push through. Um, okay. So uh, let me just read this what Chase said because I when I'm talking I just refuse to read chat and like I I then will have missed out on a bunch of stuff. The best kind of question, the most suitable one for determining essence, does not refer to discrete examples but at the continuity of concrete objects taken in their becoming. Well, I don't really know what he means by that, but it's pretty cool. It sounds pretty dope. It sounds kind of exciting and you know spacey. That's cool. That's pretty cool. But uh, basically, I I guess. This is one thing. I, I, okay, okay, okay. I think that this is, yeah, it was pretty cool. I, I think that this is part of where Matt Squires is coming from. You know, good old Michael uh, in class who uh, seems to, he's, okay, just for context, for, the, for everybody here that's not Nevada and I, Matthew Squires is in our Meaning of Life class, and he's very, he, for the last like two or three weeks, he has just been stuck on this example yes the one who stole the part of my mic stand so he has been stuck on this example of using the holocaust as this um as this as this uh important important term in our experience and in our consciousness as our collective psyche in our 
in our social totality, the Holocaust exists as one of the terms in the multiplicity of terms that orients us and defines this social totality. So in this, in this way that, that Matt Squires employs the Holocaust, he, 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 I don't know necessarily how far I would agree with him, but he, he, he points towards something that I, yeah, that I can, um, that I can appreciate. And I, again, I don't know how much of this I agree with, but this is Matt Squires' words. And then I'll go into kind of a thing that I wanted to say about um, a more direct, like, uh, like interpretation of the idea. He, he puts it as like the Holocaust happened and we are at a point in, in the, the form of a, um, as, as, a, as a social edifice, as a collective social edifice of individuals, of symbolic beings that symbolize their experience, we cannot exist pre-Holocaust anymore. The Holocaust happened and we can't unring that bell. We cannot write a pre-Joycean novel now that James Joyce has written the novel. We are in a post-Joycean landscape. We're in a post-Holocaust landscape. And the way that, the way that uh, Matt Squires kind of takes this is he says, the Holocaust is sort of like a litmus test. Uh, where, where I can point to it consistently and I can say this is a thing that happened and that should not happen again. This is an event that occurred that should not occur anymore. And, and, and he says that's yes. And he says that's like and, and, and the way that Matt Squires words it again. I'm really trying to push this onto him because I don't want to just in case there's any inconsistencies. He says it's like a moment of drawing a line in the sand where it's like this event occurred and I, in my position at the social totality, decide that it was evil, that, that I, and I recognize that it was decided both with the people around me and by myself, that it was an evil occurrence or a thing, that, or at the very least, if we don't want to call it evil, because that's too essentialist, a thing that shouldn't happen anymore, a thing that was negative in some sense, or, or I don't know, deleterious to our creative free spirits or something. And, and his basic reproach against Nietzsche is that it doesn't seem like there's a consistent Nietzschean standpoint that you can take up where you can say the Holocaust is de facto not good and should not ever happen again. The Holocaust was a definitively regrettable bad thing. That's at least Matt Squire's position. And Eric, you might actually have something to say about that where there is a Nietzschean position where you could say that it's a bad thing. But uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but uh, just to clarify something, and where I think like Matt Squires gets this is is this um, Hegel's move from from uh, subject for some, from substance to subject. The move from substance to subject in Hegel is the same move, which is is the entirety of phenomenology of spirit is just an illustration of this move from consciousness to self consciousness. Well, from from substance to uh, self-consciousness, like from substance to self sense certainty, and then to, um, you know, perception and then understanding. And then you, you know, all that stuff. <clears throat> so, and the, I think I mean, I talked to this about this before, but the basic move is that consciousness looks at the images in front of it. And, and, and this sounds kind of Nietzsche and it's at the start, he, it look at consciousness or some experience subject, whatever we can call a subject seeks the hidden substantial essence behind the veil of appearances that surround it at a certain point. There's some sort of search for consistency. This is what Nietzsche would say is the moment where we start equating um, little green things with other little green things and calling them leaves and deluding ourselves into thinking that we found some sort of essential quality known as leafiness. Uh, so consciousness gets this urge to seek the hidden substantial essence behind the veil of appearance. And in this searching for this substantial essence behind the veil of appearance, it passes into self-consciousness when it realizes that there is nothing beyond this veil. And this is also kind of, I mean, this isn't quite Nietzsche, but it's something that Nietzsche would say is a good thing to recognize that there's nothing beyond this veil. There's nothing behind this veil. Nietzsche would say that, I, I mean, I don't know what he thinks about the moment that that happens. I don't know if he cares, but I know that Hegel is like, that's a big step. That's a big, big moment where consciousness becomes self-consciousness. When it sees that there's nothing behind essence except for what it puts there, what the subject puts there. And in this passage, we gain nothing, right? And I think Nietzsche would say that, we gain nothing. 
we, Hegel and Nietzsche would agree. We, we don't gain anything by, by digging around in our, in our void, but, but Hegel would say we gain nothing. We gain capital N nothing. We gain a positive nothing, which makes the appearances that we see appearances. They wouldn't be appearances if we weren't subjects subject to appearances. They would be something else, like like um, like what uh, Kant talks about in Critique of Judgment when he says that a human being, or not that maybe a, a subject, even if we could even call it a subject as such, that is is given access to to um, the noumenal would be like a puppet on strings, uh, or or better yet, to take um. Heidegger's notion of technology and his and his argument about the, the problem that technology poses against us, it's like the move in, in Hegel from, from a plant that has its entrails buried into the earth to a, an animal that has its entrails pulled up inside of itself. Technology looks at us as symbolic plants with our symbolic entrails buried into the symbolic life world that we live in. And technology threatens to, to, to cut us like a scythe and pluck us up from the ground and make us into something that, that is not part of a differential symbolic edifice. And that's what people talk about when they talk about singularity and AI post-labor hoo-ha or whatever. Uh, so the point is, <laughs> We gain nothing, a positive nothing. This nothing that we gain is the subject itself. That's why it's a self-consciousness. I move from consciousness to self-consciousness when the consciousness becomes conscious of itself. It becomes self-consciousness. It gains the nothing that is the subject itself, the void of subjectivity that is within the thing. Yeah, accelerationism. No, not really. Um, so, and then the basic, like, like a big point to make here is, is that, the super sensible or the things beyond our sense perception, uh, it's, it's, they, they all, and Nietzsche would agree with this too. It all comes from a world of appearances, which has mediated it all, you know, all the, the, this, everything we could call essence is really just um, this, uh, you know, this thing coming from the world of appearances, which are just rules or regulatory faculties or whatever. Uh, appearance is the essence of that essence and it's filling. Appearance is the essence of essence, and is that is the filling of that essence. Appearance is the essence of all things that are super sensible. Appearance is is it's appearance qua appearance. It's appearance through the 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 root of appearance on the highway towards essence. The lesson of of and this is just coming from um, actually sex and the failed absolute. But usually I keep talking about this part. The lesson of Hegel, Lacan, and for him, Plato, and I don't know why, because I keep seeing it as a parallel to Aristotle with hylomorphisms, but he just insists that it's not the case. And I don't know why, but he says it's the lesson of Hegel, Lacan, and Plato, that it's not, it's not that everything is appearance and there is no true reality, so fuck it all. Uh, there's no, it's all just a consistent, it's not, it's all an inconsistent pandemoniac void of, of, of bullshit. Uh, and, and there's nothing beyond appearance, uh, and thus there's this victory for sophistry and skepticism, right? And, 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 and the argument is that it's not that. It's that essence is not just appearance, but it's appearance as appearance. It's essence appearing in contrast to appearance within appearance. It's the part of appearance that appears in contrast with appearance. It's, it's the distinction, the very distinction, the very notion of making a distinction at all between essence and appearance as two terms, the very possibility for us to make a distinction whatsoever between essence and appearance is inscribed on appearance itself. And it comes to us in appearance. It is, it is the, the dialectical opposition between essence and appearance where appearance wins out de facto and, and the spears are shattered, asymmetry is reintroduced, and appearance is the fundamentally, like, like uh, you know, um, over, overarching term, you know, 
that, that gives us the access to the very distinction of essence and appearance to begin with. Appearance wins. And Nietzsche, if Hegel were to describe this dialectical move where appearance wins, he'd be like, oh, that's great. I love that. I love appearance winning. I love it when appearance wins. I'm a big fan of appearance and I don't believe in the essence thing. But I think that Hegel would say, but that does not remove the fact that the other term in the dialectic that is inscribed onto the, uh, onto the flesh of appearance itself is essence. It is, it is an, an essence. And this essence comes from the void of subjectivity, the nothing that is behind appearance, as the medium of interplay and the foundational core of, of, of meaning and difference and stuff like that. I think that Hegel very much asserts that a negative, a, a, an impossibility, a barring is the first instance of a thing exploding into a multiplicity. He would be like, uh, it seems like a lot of things that Deleuze and Hegel seem to argue about the way things operate, like in this multiplicitous form and in this rhizomatic way. I think Hegel would say, uh, yes, they can, they can behave in this way, but only after they have been it's like a particle accelerator shooting a single atom towards like a plate and then the particle explodes into a million you know uh superpositions or something that's the multiplicity for hegel he says that there's before the multiplicity before the shattering and the exploding into this wild continuum there's this there's this negation of the thing at ground and uh yeah yeah Hunter, I have a question. Um, I, I want to. So you said something in class one day, and I want to know if I have the correct interpretation, or if I understood you correctly. So, if you, earlier today you talked about the uh, field of antagonism, and I, the the impression I had from what you said, and that, I just want to know if I, if this is incorrect, was that this field of antagonism tends to produce the uh, produce similar kinds of structures. Um, I don't know, I guess because of the nature of this field of antagonism that it tends to produce similar structures and that then in essence is the is that similarity among these structures that this field of antagonism tends to produce consistently. Is that is that correct? Yes, I guess I, I think I can see where, okay, I can see a big thing here. And I, I think it's that, I, 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 I'm having a hard time, I'm having a hard time totally conceiving of essence as pattern as as the thing of patterns um as like this point of patterns and and stuff like that i i see it i see the way that i conceive of essence or the place that i see essence as uh, that the place that i see essence having is is purely as an object in opposition to appearance essence exists purely as that which is opposed to appearance Essence is only ever the thing that we posit as opposed to appearance, as the thing that is not quite appearance. And in that sense is appearance because we, all we have is appearances, right? So, okay. Um, there's, that, there's, that Hegelian, uh, there's that Hegelian system of being essence and notion, right? You know, they have the being and the essence and the notion. Um, this... Um, this being essence notion thing uh, is, is illustrated by this one Russian guy on this paper that I haven't read and by Zizek actually in this book, Sex in the Failed Absolute, uh, where he argue, he compares being an essence and notion to the Mobius strip, the cross cap and the Klein bottle where the, the Mobius strip comes from uh, uh, Hegel uh, talking about the, the movement of spirit as being uh, defined by, or like at least the the one of the one of the primary features of the movement of spirit is what he called the inside inverted eight, 
which was his like uh, 1800s version of a Mobius strip. Uh, so the Mobius strip is in a way being, and I could talk about how we get to the Mobius strip if, you, if we wanna talk about that, but the Mobius strip is the first step. It's the first thing that Hegel explicitly enumerated. He said, the being operates in this way, epistemology and reality, epistemology and ontology operate in the same way for Hegel. Hegel argues that epistemology and ontology are like, like this, like inextricable. Epistemology and ontology are linked ideas that operate in the exact same like pattern. So being is defined, at least in a way, is, um, defined by the coincidence of opposites, the lack of any proper difference or identity whatsoever. Basically at, at, at base level, at the zero level of being for Hegel, there's not really any notion of difference, nor is there really any notion of identity that's possible in the, in the, the existence of the, of the Mobius strip, because this is where that logical thing comes from of like, if you start with a contradiction, you can prove anything. And it's like, yeah, if I say that like a thing that is not a thing, like if I say that A is not B and therefore A is B, it's like, yes, I, I, I don't know. Um, so if I, if I start with a contradiction, I can prove anything. Uh, but that's the case in the realm of being for Hegel. Hegel agrees. Like if you start with a contradiction and you don't take it anywhere, yeah, you'll just be able to prove anything and you won't get anywhere. But the cross cap is this, and the cross cap, I, 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 I don't know what, I don't know what Hegel would call it. I think he would call it a concrete universal. Hegel called it a concrete universal, and Lacan called it the quilting point of reality. So the the, the cross cap, a cross cap is this three dimensional shape. It's this unorientable Euclidean ge geometrical shape that is basically a Mobius strip that has been. Uh, cut off or interrupted and then closed itself like a, like f like a wound, like flesh. Like imagine if you if you took a Mobius strip, you slice into it and then it's all like meaty and it kind of fuses back together for some reason. It's like, okay. So a cross cap is the basic visualization for Zizek of essence. Um, the introduction of difference. The, that's where as soon as essence enters into the formula, difference is introduced. And this, this is where I think Hegel and Nietzsche would agree that early man was this like, this kind of paw, this like creature pawing at its, at its surroundings, looking for some sort of essence or pattern or, 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 or some hidden meaning behind appearance. And, and it was only then that they started coming up with these bogus concepts like knowledge and like universal truth and like good and evil. You know what I mean? Like, I think that Hegel and Nietzsche would agree that there was that, that early point where they were together before the introduction of essence, before the introduction of difference. There's this, or upon the introduction of difference, there's this embodiment of a, of a cut this cut that interrupts the Mobius strip, right? This cut that interrupts the Mobius strip is the introduction of difference and the, and the existence of essence proper in reality and in appearance or, or in epistemology. So where does that cut come from? It is just, and this is the logic of all of Hegel's notion of antagonism. This is how all antagonisms work for Hegel. It is this physical or like this embodiment of this antagonism, this cut, this slice, this, this thing, it is just a, a, a manifestation or an embodiment of a cut that already existed. That was, it was already internal to the strip itself. Internal to the strip itself, there was already a cut. And that cut was made manifest in the cross cap. And the, the, when I, the, like, how I can explain for what that cut is, imagine the void that surrounds the Mobius strip. The Mobius strip exists in a void and that split between itself and the void is is i guess you could say it's almost evidential of this of this oppositional nature of the mobius strip to something or at least this preeminent no uh, like a existence of antagonism within the mobius strip which then becomes embodied or manifested within the cross cap and then ultimately then he takes this logic further and says when you take two cross caps and he literally says this glue them together 
I, I don't know. He says, if you take two cross crabs and glue them together, you get a Klein bottle. And the Klein bottle is like the notion in Hegel, uh, where, where the, 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 or at least the, the subject is the, the Klein bottle with a, the black hole at the center, which swallows everything and makes man into the night of the world and puts the subject into a position where the frame of experience itself is inframed by a part of its content. And thus the subject enters the whole and returns as the very body which the whole is in upon reaching notion in a way. Uh, so that's, and then I could keep talking about the coincidence of opposites and the rule of the convoluted space of dialectics, but I'm not going to. Oh, that was, okay, yeah. Um, so, I think I kind of have a switch topic somewhat, but because I feel like this is something that really needs to be drawn out of Nietzsche, uh, basically because he talks so much about morality. And I think at least me, I like, I think a lot of people here, we like the, the metaphysical interpretation and kind of stay away from the the morality thing, but I, I think trying to understand that I, is part of one of the reasons I think why you know I'm engaging in in this reading and whatnot to try to get a sense of it and you know and how how does this apply to our world now you know um, so when I read this part the 107 the last part of that second book our ultimate gratitude to art. I found it pretty interesting here. So he's he's um, making a distinction here between aesthetics, art, in the sense of it gives us this distance from ourselves so that we can laugh at ourselves and not take ourselves too seriously. And the contrast with that is getting completely caught up in morality. So he says, uh, yeah. For the sake of the overly serious, severe demands that we there make on ourselves to become virtuous monsters and scarecrows, we have also to be able to stand above morality and not just to stand with the anxious stiffness of someone who is afraid of slipping and falling at any moment, but also to float and play above it. How then could we possibly do without art and with the fool? Okay, so the person who shot up those uh, massage parlor things in Atlanta, I was thinking about this with my friends live in Atlanta and I was talking to them and they were talking uh, about, so this guy was, was he Catholic? I think he was Catholic. So, and so basically he was, he had the, no, he wasn't Catholic. That wasn't, that's not true. Uh, no, I'm getting story confused. Okay, this guy, he thought that um, that sex was this thing that was basically, you know, it's immoral, uh, like masturbation is immoral, like, and like, really, like, you're going to hell, basically, if, if you engage in this, and had these very strict, severe demands of him, and because of this, when he would uh, relapse, when he'd get caught up and someone who is afraid of slipping and falling at any moment, this kind of overly severe demands on the self that that morality makes when we can't distance ourselves from it and just simply laugh at ourselves. So I think this is one of the great things where Nietzsche's critique on morality works. Because, you know, you can people say like, oh, well, is he saying, you know, the Holocaust is okay, you know, all this stuff like that. I, I don't think that's a good way of trying to look into Nietzsche and what he sees. I, I think this is kind of, this is the kind of stuff he's talking about when he questions morality and says, we need to go beyond morality in some sense. We need to have some kind of freedom from it. Uh, I think this is a good example of what he's talking about there. And this idea of this lightness that, where we can uh, simply look outside of the, the moral frame of things because it does make, you know, it turns us into virtuous monsters where <laughs> we're afraid of slipping and falling at any moment. And uh, I think this is a, that's a good 
real world example of exactly what happens when morality becomes this all consuming thing and someone can't laugh at themselves anymore until eventually they can't just even live with themselves anymore. And then uh, eventually you get resentment towards everyone that just explodes out. And yeah, seem, seems very relevant for today. Um, so yeah, that, that's my take on that. I don't know. Do you guys think that that applies or, or, or what? I don't know. Sean, you should go. You've got your hand up. Oh, sorry. That was left over from me kind of wanting to respond to Hunter, but I was sort of just doing that in chat. Uh, uh, somebody else wants to go. I'm, I'm chill with them. Well, I've just had two beers, which is unusual for me, both to have two, one right after the other, and also this time of day, but they're um, a beer my wife got for a picnic and Anyway, I decided now is a good time to get rid of them. So I say that because my thoughts may not be completely coherent here. <laughs> so here's what I'm gonna, what, what, what I, I think about the Holocaust thing. Um, my, on my reading of Nietzsche. So I read Nietzsche, he calls himself an immoralist. I, yeah, thank God it's not PBR, good Lord. Oh, God, look at that. Oh, such, <laughs> such chutzpah, such rebellion, such terror, as Nietzsche would say, such bad taste. Anyway, um, so, so what, so what I, the way I think about, I, you know, I, you know, as all of this, it's, you know, it's, it's my interpretation. I think I have good textual support, but then other people would think they have good textual support for a different view. But anyway, so here's my, my view. I think rather than calling himself an immoralist, I, th I think he should have called himself an amoralist. And I, I think, on my view, he, do, that he thinks moral, morality is a euphemism for power. And that when someone says this is right, what they mean is, I want this to be, tr I want this to be the case. And so, and I, and I think the, I think that he believes we use morality as a justification, as a sort of a supernatural or superhuman justification for our assertions of power. So when I say, for example, the Holocaust is evil, what I'm doing is I am, I am demanding that everyone accept my judgment as a universal value. And that I think, I don't think Nietzsche thinks there are any truly universal values. There are just assertions of power. And so that's what I, I think he would say. Now, as far as whether the, you know, the Holocaust shouldn't have happened or not. So I, I think that, you know, on my reading, Nietzsche would say, again, the whole world is all the way down to the ontological level, through the human level, psychological and social and historical is again competing wills to power and competing structures of wills to power. And so that political and social tensions are, again, they're, 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 they're wars of values. And so, and those values are manifestations of the wills, the wills, to, the wills of those people. And so I think what Nietzsche would say, this is my view, what he would say is about the Holocaust is that the, you had these two warring factions and to say that one was morally good and the other one was morally evil is just attaching words to justify one's position, to give one's own assertions of power an aura of divinity, an aura of supernatural authority. And that they're really what it comes down to are conflicts of power. And so what I think he would say is, you know, that the, the, the allies can say to the Axis powers, we can make you stop because we don't like what you're doing. But then when the Axis powers say, and the reason we should make you stop is because we're morally right and you're morally wrong, I think Nietzsche would say, 
you're just just you're trying to justify your own assertions of power with an aura of supernatural authority and and that surely if you you know if the the axis powers say we believe or the uh, allies say we we hate what you're doing and we're going to make you stop I think Nietzsche's on a Nietzsche's analysis, that's where the conflict ends. You know, if the Nietzsche, if the Axis powers had a one, and and you know, you have something like I don't know if you've I've I, it's been too long since I read the novel, so I apologize to Chase for this, but I've been watching the I've watched the uh, TV version of The Man on the High Castle, which includes a lot of bullshit about quantum bullshit and sorts of bullshit. But anyway. <laughs> But the idea is you have an alternative history where the Nazis and the Japanese won and they split up the US. And, you know, well, well is that inherently evil? I don't think Nietzsche would say, if you're going to be honest, I don't, I think he would say, you can say that, but you're again, just, you're, you're trying to make your, your power position have this sort of d- divine aspect. But you can definitely say, for example, as the, as the, um, insurgents, you can say, we hate what you're doing. You know, we hate what the Nazis are doing in, to this country and we're gonna make them stop. So I don't think he would say that whoever happens to be in power is in fact the moral authority, which is like what Thrasymachus says in the Republic. I just, but although I think really Thrasymachus is being more like Nietzsche than, but anyway, I don't think he would say that Nietzsche would say, no, they're the morally correct. I would say hey, there is no such thing as morally correct. There's just power. And, and, and if you, you know, and so as the underdog who thinks that what the Axis powers are doing is absolutely horrible, you can say, that's absolutely horrible. I hate it. I'm going to make you fucking stop. But then, but then to say, and that is in fact, the divinely inspired correct truth that is universally correct for all times and all places. I think he would say, you're just making that shit up to justify your own view. That's, that's my, what I think he would say. Yeah. I, I like that. And the fact that, you know, because he's not saying, uh, it's all, it's therefore all bad that, you know, power is being exercised in this way. It, he's, I think he would equally say, you know, that, um, yeah, I can resist, you know, the Holocaust and Nazis and, and everything um, without also having to invoke some kind of universal morality necessarily. But for the simple fact that, okay, yes, you know, there's good and bad relative to me, uh, it relative to say conditions of life or something like that. And from that, simply the fact that I, I feel that that is something that should not be done, that people, yeah, should not be, you know, massacred and slaughtered and all these things, that that's an exercise of my power. And that's just as, you know, just like another exercise of power, except, you know, then it comes, there's the question then, okay, so what, where do we get, uh, you know, our evaluations from? Uh, where do we get the sense of things and whatnot? Um, because the thing is that, you know, Nietzsche did have some values that he saw worth basically valuing, some kind of evaluation. So I, I think he, that's where it gets into the whole life affirmation thing because that's essentially what guides then okay so we have these different values these different uh wills to power what what will to power should we select well we should select the will to power that basically affirms the will to power uh we should basically you know reiterate the original kind of creativity of the will to create um, which I think is interesting because it's similar to what he says in the birth of tragedy about the creation of art that there, okay, so there's this opposition in the ground, this, this desire for appearance in the ground, the Dionysian ground, and then 
that is what gives way to uh, this world of art that is used to then justify existence. And I think, so he says that the artist is someone who can uh, reiterate that original desire for bringing things into an appearance that makes life something worth uh, actually engaging in. And that seems to me kind of also what he does later with this whole idea of, you know, life affirmation, the will to power, that basically what we should do is, is go back towards that, you know, metaphysical principle of creativity and desire and whatnot and reiterate that and what works with that in this, in this positive, um, active, assertive manner that can help guide us and, and give us some kind of orientation, you know, within this, uh, you know, massive, this infinite sea of, of possible orientations where God is dead and we don't know up and down and, you know, backwards and sideways and whatnot. Where do we go from here? Um, because I, you know, I, I don't think relativism is an option. We need to be able to, to say, you know, that uh, no to Holocaust. I, I think that is very important. And I think that is not antagonistic to what Nietzsche is saying, really. So, yeah, that's, that's my take on that. I can maybe add, like, I don't know, I think maybe three addendums, I guess, to what was said. I think, um, I, I think more or less I'm in, in agreement with, with both Chase and Nevitt, but, but part, of, uh, part of what I want to point out, I think there's a subtle distinction that can be made between my viewing of certain ethical facts as being, so, so this, is what I think, uh, this is what I think Nietzsche actually believes in, and I think it's slight, subtly different from, from what Nevitt said. Uh, there's a difference between me, you know, sort of cynically selecting values on the basis of um, what would be valuable or convenient to me versus me just expressing values that are the logical outcome of the type of entity that I am, if that sort of makes sense. And I think it's important to keep those two things distinct. That I, I think Nietzsche is suggesting that, not that I, I just select uh, values in this egoistic manner, where uh, I just select the values that, uh, that, that seem most useful to me at any moment, and then I can just discard them at any other moment. Because we see that that doesn't happen a lot, right? Like people really struggle to discard values even as they become toxic to their own existence. But that like values are this product of the type of entity that I am. And to the, to the extent that I can discard them and embrace new values, I, I like it has to be that, that speaks to a certain kind of flexibility in my nature that is itself, I think, like a kind of virtue that, that Nietzsche would be fond of, but it isn't necessarily present or isn't necessarily there. Um, the other element of this is that I, I, I think it's important to note that values aren't just, uh, like, I, I sometimes I, I, um, I get worried that we sort of reduce uh, Nietzsche down to a kind of emotivism, right? So AJR Air is this, is this um, uh, sort of... Uh, but he was associated with philosophy of science movement, right? So sort of analytic side of philosophy. And he had this like, concept of emotivism, this idea that my ethics is just, uh, ethics is just an expression of, uh, uh, you know, approval or disapproval with respect to, like, so if I say this is good or bad, I might as well be saying, boo this or yay this, right? Like, I, you're right. it doesn't have any meaning beyond that. And I think that, I, that, I think that's one possible interpretation of what Nietzsche is saying, but I think we can, I think we can tease something a little bit more subtle out of him because I, I actually think that um, that ethics, while they are ex expressions of our of our conception of what's happening or our our um, our beliefs about the uh, about the world as an expression of our nature, our, our expression of our existence, I also think that ethics operates as one avenue of an expression of power, right? So it's not just that um, you know the allies hated you know what the nazis were doing and wanting this wanted to stop them in fact i actually think that the causality right if you pay attention to the history of what happened with world war ii that the causality kind of went in the opposite direction right the allies decided that they were going to defeat the nazis and then they went out and they found the things that the nazis did that would justify the war effort and inflame and uh, and impassion people to actually fight in that war so publishing information about for instance uh, uh the holocaust 
retroactively justified the, the, the military actions of the allies in the war in an interesting sort of way that, uh, that wasn't necessarily identical to um, the reasons why the allies entered into that war in the first place. So again, this is this, the, like, I actually think this is an example of that cynical operation that I was mentioning. It's just that I, I don't think that's always what's happening. Um, but I think it's interesting to note that taking a moral stance and not just taking it cynically, but taking it, e even taking it legitimately, really believing that something is wrong or right is, an, is a move. It is, it is something that gives you power in a particular kind of situation, a power to force yourself to act, a power to persuade or convince others, a power to frame or capture a certain kind of situation. And so in that sense, morality just isn't the expression of power. Morality is a kind of power. Um, and and it, conceiving of it as such, I think, is, is, is vital in terms of an interpretation of Nietzsche. All right, that's, th those are my addendums. I, those are the ways I want us to be careful in terms of how we're discussing this. Yeah, so uh, I like I think you made some good points. Uh, so especially the idea of okay, and I think that this is also this is something that is ambiguous in Nietzsche's um, larger uh, text and whatnot. Um, is you know this question of egoism, because at times he he does. Uh, essentially kind of say that at times, I think that uh, this kind of egoistic affirmation would is something that could could work in some way that that is okay. But also at times he he attacks that idea of the individual. And I think that's really important for understanding exactly where we can uh, what we can do with this in a creative way, you know, what, how can we take Nietzsche's philosophy and use it today now uh, in a way that that's okay, you know? Um, and I think his idea that he, you know, no leaf is the same as a leaf. No, a leaf really isn't a leaf. It's just saying that's a name. It, it kind of creates the leaf by calling it the leaf eventually you see, but um, we're kind of the same way in the, the sense that we're this, this stream that is given some kind of, uh, continuity, not only just in this, you know, cycle, this, this continuity of appearance and whatnot, but also in the fact that there is this, this naming of us that, that gives us this kind of self-reflective kind of aspect. But, um, I think he wants to bring attention to the fact that we are not this simple uh, unity also, th just like the, you know, the leaf is not either. And I think that would go along with the, the fact that, okay, he sees the, um, you know, where where's the basis of our values coming from? Um, I think he would, if we can question the, the unity of the subject and be able to see that there's something going on that's much bigger than this kind of naive way of saying like, oh, I'm just, I'm Chase Saladino. Can't you see my name right there? It says Chase Saladino. I'm me, you know? And, you know, I think what is ethics, but really basically uh, questions of where your identity is at, basically. You know, if you think my identity is basically, I'm a white Christian, and then you act from that of basically everything that's good for white Christians or whatnot is my thing, or whatever your identity, is, your, your sphere of identity is at, usually is the thing that you'll make decisions based off of those and you'll make moral evaluations of this is good and this is bad based off of what is good or bad for this this big level of identity that that whatever I'm at, you know. So I think that identification of where people are at is, is very crucial and being able to have this kind of skepticism towards identities is is crucial to that. So I think even ourselves, it would be, it's, it's very, 
uh, naive simply to to try to act from this this very simple idea of myself as this ego and then I can just simply do things for my ego and it's all good you know and this kind of emotive way of evaluating things just based off of this this self-enclosed identity first of all because that self-enclosed identity is is this very contingent thing um but then first of all you know uh, I think it's really a question of okay if it's not this identity then you know where is this really coming from i think there's there's this call not only just to to create things but also to to create ourselves in some way that goes beyond this mere facticity of oh i'm just going to do things for myself in this way that's not really a, a kind of aesthetic uh value that i think nietzsche would kind of support in that sense so i think that's crucial to basically what we can do with him is see that along with this this kind of power of determining values also comes this um this demand i guess for self-creation in a way that that is appropriate to that the realization of that power to create values so that's why the this this um critique of identity that he has this and also this emphasis on process i think that has to be placed uh also with this idea of moral evaluation and how these are also this fluctuating process and whatnot so we have to connect those because i think a lot of people they they dislodge uh one or the other um, and say, you know, oh, well, morals are relative. That means me, this just solid, distinct thing can just uh, do whatever uh, for that solid, distinct thing. And I think instead, we have to have both sides of those movements. We have to be able to see that, no, this is actually something I'm creating. I'm creating myself in some way that it isn't separate from those evaluations and vice versa. They're, you know, a Mobius strip. So, yeah, that's where I would, and I guess that also connects with, you know, the stuff we were talking about earlier in the sense of, you know, this, uh, like, essence and appearance and whatnot. I, I think he's calling on us to say, to, to create these things and not just simply rely on, oh, I'm, you know, this factoid right here. Um, instead, it's, it's, in the same way, we can create our new our new values. We can choose these things. We can do this also with uh, these concepts that eventually become, you know, our essence and whatnot. So, okay, I feel like I'm I'm at that stage where I just start repeating myself in new ways. So I'm going to mute myself and drink PBR. Oh, that is such bad taste. Um, so I know we're out of time, but I, so just a couple of thoughts on that. One thing, you know, the, the, the idea of self-creation and Nietzsche's model of the soul, if you were, are in tension with one another. And so, you know, when you say self-creation, that there implies a unitary subject, like I can create myself. And so, if you dis, if you, if you uh, deny a unitary subject, which I think you're right, I think Nietzsche thinks that the soul is a civic organ. I mean, he says things like this: it's, it's a civic organization of wills to power, and and so that's why I think one reason he says things like "become who you are," because there's this ambiguity between you know what does self creation mean if quote, I, if there is no unitary I, and if what I experience as I is, a, is sort of a, is sort of a, uh, almost an epiphenomenon of this, these competing wills to power that constitute my being. And so there's, and I mean, I actually don't have a clear answer as to that. That's just one, still one of the mysteries that, that I, for me, for Nietzsche is, you know, because he taught, he, he talks like a determinist sometimes, well, you're just a society of wills to power. And at other times he talks like, 
I don't know that I, I don't think he's a libertarian, but something more like a, some kind of compatibilist. Um, one thing I think is clear, or I think, and I, I'm, this isn't unique with me, but that one of the things he's doing is calling on people who feel a, uh, a, a coherent identity, which I think for Nietzsche means that there is a dominating, he called what he calls a dominating instinct in some texts, a dominating will to power or a dominating oligarchy of wills to power that produces a sort of coherent personality. That those who have that and experience that, the herd, the herd, herd mentality and herd morality makes those people feel bad about themselves. They have a bad conscience. And so that those people who have, which I think are, he thinks are like a lot of artists and philosophers, a lot of creative people. The reason that they're creative is because they actually have this sort of this, this um, coherent drive structure that is able to ride herd on all that chaos underneath them and, and employ that chaos as a powerhouse of energy to to deploy this creative energy. But because herd morality is, is fundamentally about the common denominator, making everyone exactly the same, you know, think Harrison Berger on here, that that's what her, herd morality is all about, that, that the herd tends to give people that are very creative and powerful a bad conscience. It makes them feel bad about that. Oh my God, I shouldn't be that way. And so, you know, I think one of his one of his rhetorical efforts is to to tell those folks you you ought not to feel bad about that. That's you shouldn't you know you should you should be excited about the fact that you have this coherent drive towards some sort of creative project. Of course, it's problematic if that person turns out to be Caesar Borgia or Napoleon or whatever. And I don't quite know what to say about that, frankly. But it seems, you know, again, it seems like his favorite people really are more artists and philosophers and people like that, even more so than these abusive political figures. So, <sighs> can I, can I, uh, one, one last uh, addendum, even though we're at 16 minutes over time? I'm very surprised. I read 109. And I got worried because I thought this was going to turn into a horrible uh, litigation of whether or not I'm justified in my pantheism. Because 109 really made me sit down and reflect oh, on that. I totally got the, the same thing. And so I, I actually have some disagreements with Nietzsche about a few things here. So I, I, I didn't mean to cut you off, Sean, but um, mainly with the idea, okay, so I'm not going to get into this, but this the anthropomorphism sometimes when people really stress that, that's because they're being anthropocentric in the sense of saying these things couldn't possibly have the features that humans have. Only humans have reason. We, you can't project that, you know? Uh, so there's a problem there, I think. But okay, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, wow. I guess I kind of did actually, yeah. <laughs> No, no, it was good. I, I, I was only going to say that, but I, I, I think I agree with you, and I, I think that, um, uh, you know, part of my response to to Nietzsche here is, is uh, well, a part of it is is me actually kind of uh, wanting to embrace like a, a certain aspect of the, of it, right? Like this is why I'm always hesitant hesitant to to embrace a position like panpsychism, is because I'm like, uh, uh, maybe there's a little bit too much. I, I, I worry that panpsychism it tends towards anthropocentrism a little bit too much in the analysis but i'm you know that isn't to say it's right or wrong and i think that uh um but i think that nietzsche presents here a, like a kind of sensibility of suspicion that is i think really important to me even as i do kind of emphasis emphasize these pantheistic ideas and stuff like that so it's i, I kind of want to hold hold it hold them in tension and so that's all i was going to say about it but i was surprised i was expecting to get like I don't know, was screwed to the rack or something uh, today, and then it didn't even come up. Yeah, I think Whitehead could be used to critique a lot of the stuff he says on here, but in a way that's not like the total opposition or some kind of like inversion, but I, I think he's kind of partially correct on a lot of these things. 
but uh, yeah, it's kind of like, okay, are we talking about, you know, the, just this simple naive ego doing all these things uh, or in the same way, panpsychism, will we talk about this kind of um, non-conscious uh, affect being this simple ability of to affect and be affected is that what is it more of a pan experientialism that isn't anthropocentric or is it simply the way that so one of my friends he has he does this he, he thinks panpsychism means everything is conscious everything is has consciousness and then you know in this sense of like that's clearly i think uh anthropomorphism and anthropocentrism both um where you're thinking that like uh my my pbr can you know has feelings and stuff like that uh i don't think that's correct i'll just say that um but still i think you know there's degrees of of this thing this it doesn't all emerge with humans and i think that's and i think eventually uh Nietzsche does get around to some form of uh, a kind of pan experientialism, I think. Um, Deleuze actually kind of explicitly argues for that in, in this very Spinoza's way, but that's, yeah, we're like 20 minutes over. So yeah, I'm done. <laughs> Any uh, last essential comments? Okay. Will to power. Will to power. Okay, well, thank you. I'm going to preserve my will to power and kill the session. <laughs> See you next week. That sounds Thanks. good. I, I'm willing bye -bye. to let my will to power be commanded this time because I'm going to be commanding all your wills to power over the rest of the next couple months. You're yeah. all beholden to me. All right. <laughs> oh, you, God, you have your right. fun now. You know, I'm going to pull out a bunch of dark to lose, and it's just going to be me, like, 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 a terroristically undermining every aspect of the it's session. It's, it's like Rasengan versus Sasuke. We're going to be like, all right, <laughs> all, right, all, right, all right, I'm done. Okay, bye, everybody. I bye. Didn't get the at all. Bye. 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 <laughs>